Katie Wilson. I'm a research scientist at OU Sims at the NOAA National Severe Storms Lab. And my research focuses on how forecasters and other end users can use new types of technology and data for the weather forecast process. And so that means not only do I use methods and technologies um, and knowledge from the meteorology field, but I also look to other fields to answer some of my research questions, such as human factors and the social sciences. And so my interest in meteorology um, really started when I was around 15 years old. There was no cool weather event, nothing that particularly stood out to me. I was just very interested in the world around me. And so I made my education choices just based on what I enjoyed. And in England, which is where I grew up, where I was born and raised, the, the, uh, the education system is very different there. We start specializing from an early age. And so that means that from the age of 16 to 18, all I studied was mathematics, physics, and psychology. And so when I was 18, I went off to the University of Reading. That's where I got my undergraduate degree in meteorology. That experience was wonderful, especially because I was able to do an exchange year at the University of Oklahoma. And so in 2010, I came to OU. I studied at the School of Meteorology here at the National Weather Center. And this was my very first time in the United States. I was so excited. And I was blown away by the facilities here and just the research and the work that is going on was very impressive and exciting. And something else happened during that year. I met a lady, um, a female scientist, who was working on a research project where she was trying to understand how forecasters could use new radar technology to make warning decisions. And so not only was she interested in meteorology, but she was interested in some of the psychology aspects. And this just seemed fascinating to me and it felt like a place that I just had to be involved in. And so thankfully I applied to graduate school. I came back, I was able to work with a scientist for both my master's and my PhD. And um, it worked out that I'm here now. I'm working um, as a research scientist on a different program called Warn on Forecast. This is um, where we're looking to develop and use numerical weather prediction guidance in a few hours that precede storms. So that means we can use model guidance to try and predict where storms are going to occur and what kind of hazards they're going to produce with more specificity and accuracy than what we're able to do at the moment. And so in my job right now, the thing that I probably love the most is the people I work with. It sounds corny, but it really is true. There are people with all kinds of talents and skills and within our team, we have a diverse set of um, those things. So skills and talents. And it means that I'm constantly learning from my colleagues. And I think that it also makes for stronger teams and for stronger projects. Um, and so not just within the building are there lots of cool people to, to work with, but outside of the building, um, the people that we do research with. And so a lot of my time I'm working with National Weather Service forecasters, uh, and that is fantastic. It's something that I enjoy, I find exciting, I find very fulfilling. And most lately we've extended some of that work to other end users like emergency managers. So I'm always learning from other people and it's um, part of my job that I, I, I just thoroughly enjoy. And so um, nice to meet you and I look forward to this panel. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Highland. I'm a research meteorologist with the University of Oklahoma's Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies, supporting NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory. As a research meteorologist, I use computers to design things that weather forecasters can use to alert people about dangerous weather headed toward their locations better and faster than what we can currently do. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. You know what? I used to be afraid of thunderstorms. I would hide underneath my blanket or I'd go run into my parents' room because I was really scared. But that fear led to curiosity. I started to study more about the weather and especially thunderstorms. And it got me really excited about meteorology. And so from a young age, I decided I wanted to become a meteorologist. So much so that when I was eight years old, I saved up all of my allowance so I could buy a TV for my room so I could watch the Weather Channel all the time. So from a young age, I took as many math and science classes as I could from elementary, middle school, and high school so that I would be well prepared when I eventually go to a university to study to become a meteorologist. 
When I was in high school, I was searching around for lots of different universities that specialized in meteorology, and I eventually chose the University of Oklahoma to study meteorology because they were building a really amazing facility that was going to house all of the different components of the Norman Weather Enterprise in one space. And that's the National Weather Center, which is located on the University of Oklahoma campus. So I got to take all of my classes inside a building where there were weather forecasters, weather researchers, and lots of other technicians, faculty, staff, and students all in one place. It was a really exciting place to get a degree in meteorology. I was lucky enough during my undergraduate years that I got to work on a research project with one of my professors. I was doing really well in his class, and so he asked if I'd like to take part in a research project with one of his graduate students. We received a grant from NASA's X-Score program to study the electric field mill network around Kennedy Space Center. And this is what they use to determine whether or not they're going to launch rockets into space because they don't want to have any lightning activity around the launch site when they're going to launch one of these rockets. And so we were looking at the effectiveness of those electric field mills and how well they could detect the electric field surface and letting those people at Kennedy Space Center know about the lightning danger around their launch times. After I worked on that project with NASA, I got to work with another one of my professors using mobile Doppler weather radars to study lightning inside thunderstorms and specifically looking at lightning that is artificially triggered by rockets. Yes, you heard me correct. There's a couple facilities in the United States that do rocket triggered lightning experiments. So what they'll do is they will fire rockets up into clouds that look like they're electrified and they will try to create a lightning strike on site and use high-speed imaging cameras to take a picture of what the lightning process looks like so that we can understand lightning better than what we currently do. So for this particular experiment, we took one of our mobile Doppler weather radars and set up at a nearby airport. And then we used our radar to scan over the facility where those rocket-triggered lightning experiments were occurring. We were trying to look for specific patterns in the atmosphere or what clouds looked like that would give them either successful or unsuccessful rocket-triggered lightning attempts. And so we got to take part in several years of this research and it was a really cool project to work on. One of the coolest things I get to do as a research meteorologist is we invite different folks into the National Weather Center in a really special place that we have called the Hazardous Weather Test Bed. And inside this space is where we test out those things that we develop as research meteorologists. And the reason we invite lots of people into those spaces is because we wanna get their feedback on how useful all of these different things are and if it could be used within their offices to help them perform their jobs better. And so we invite in broadcast meteorologists, emergency managers, other forecasters and other researchers to this space where we can test out everything to see if it works. And eventually, if this is something that's useful, it can be implemented at National Weather Service forecast offices all across the United States. So as research meteorologists, we get to help develop things that will potentially save lives and property. As a meteorologist, I love teaching other people about meteorology because I want other people to be as excited about meteorology as I was excited about meteorology. So I love to do virtual visits with schools to teach them about the weather basics and also specific topics in meteorology. I also have those opportunities to answer any questions they have about the field of meteorology and all those different topics. So I really love connecting with students and other groups and teaching them and hopefully inspiring them to become meteorologists someday. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Smith, and I work as a research meteorologist at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. I'm originally from the beautiful state of West Virginia, where I was raised with a really strong connection to the wonderful outdoors and all of the cool stuff that comes with it. I've loved experiencing the natural world since I can remember. I've always been really interested in the sky and all the neat stuff happening up there. And it always seemed like I had a few more questions than the grown-ups seemingly had or wanted to answer. 
but I didn't know then what a meteorologist was. One of the few things I can remember wanting to be when I grew up was actually a dump truck driver or a trash truck driver. I was really fascinated by these large trucks that did really cool things like crunch trash and dump rocks. And you see, I'm from a part of West Virginia where blue collar work is the norm. I was the first person in my family to earn a college degree. So it was hard to even imagine that a career as a research meteorologist was even a thing people could do. Later in my high school years, I did learn about the opportunities to study weather at college. And I was thrilled by this chance. At that time, I knew for sure that weather was what I loved, but I had no idea what I would do with it. I tried a lot of different paths in college. Um, I tried broadcast meteorology, I tried operational forecasting, but they really weren't a good fit for me. I eventually did find my perfect path in getting to ask new questions and working to answer them, or in other words, research. After that, I worked with important mentors and I found some research internships that helped me really develop those skills and get me ready for grad school. I ended up here in Norman at the University of Oklahoma School of Meteorology, where I earned a PhD and I loved almost every minute of it. Now, my full-time job is asking those questions and getting to work to answer them. One of my absolute favorite ways to do that is to go out in the field and take observations of weather as it happens. I study the lowest part of the atmosphere, the layer from the surface up to a few thousand feet. And I do this to understand how storms and the environment are connected. Hopefully, this can help us learn new things about severe storms. In doing that, I get to do some cool stuff and work with state-of-the-art equipment. And that means I've traveled the US and the entire world to observe weather phenomena. Some of the vehicles I get to work with today are almost as cool as those dump trucks and trash trucks that I was so fond of as a kid. Turns out it's all a dream come true. Hi, my name is Jacob Siegel and I'm a research associate for SIM slash NSSL. I was born and raised in State College, Pennsylvania, um, where my dad worked for the Applied Research Lab at Penn State. He was then offered a job at Washington State University, so we moved, we took a road trip actually as a family across country to Washington State. And it was actually on this road trip that I um, first discovered my interest in weather. Uh, on the first day of driving across country, we were actually in Ohio, somewhere in Ohio, and we encountered this massive storm. And I can only assume that it was a supercell based on everything that happened during it. Um, but the winds were vicious, the lightning was like nothing I had ever seen before, and at the time I was actually terrified of storms, which is um, the irony of, I feel like, a lot of meteorologists is that at one point in their life they usually were terrified or intimidated by storms or something, but then turn, turn that intimidation into a passion and an interest to learn more about it. Um, so during the storm in Ohio, there was actually hail, lightning, and a tornado on the ground not too far from us that we, if we hadn't pulled over along the side of the road, there's a good chance my dad would have driven straight into it. So um, not only lucky that we pulled over, but also lucky that that storm occurred so that it, it kind of sparked my interest moving forward. Um, I lived in Washington State for about three years in Vancouver, which is just across the river from Portland, Oregon. And then after those three years, my dad got offered a job at Penn State University. So we moved back to State College and actually lived in a house about five houses down from the original house we were living in. I did my undergrad then at Penn State University, um, where I got my bachelor's in meteorology. While I was there, I worked alongside Dr. Matt Cumgen working on identifying polar metric signatures in radar for hail producing storms. and. The goal of that project really was to maybe identify a way to distinguish the size of a hailstone before it falls based on the radar data. Ended up not finding much, but it still served as a catalyst to further my interest in observational meteorology and radar data, or radar science, um, which got me actually to grad school up in Stony Brook on Long Island, New York. Uh, where I worked alongside Dr. Michael French working on identifying storm scale polar metric signatures of tornadoes as they were about to dissipate. 
after living on Long Island for two years and completing my master's, I then moved down to Norman, Oklahoma, where I am now currently working for Sims. And um, I think the, the coolest part about what I do is that growing up, um, because that, that storm experience that I had in Ohio was such a big um, factor in, in deciding what I wanted to do, and then I would be lying if I didn't also say that the movie Twister played a large role in, in sparking my interest after that as well. Um, I think my favorite thing that I get to do now is that I actually get to combine the the behind the scenes science and, and the, the grind that is working on computers with actually going out into the field and either chasing a storm or collecting data that I will then analyze later. So it, it, it creates this more personal feel with the science that um, I don't think I would have gotten from going down any other route or any other um, path. So I think that's my favorite part is how personal that the, the science of meteorology can actually feel when you find that, that little niche that really, really speaks to your soul. All right, uh, welcome to everyone who joined us. Uh, thank you for joining us today at Get to Know the Scientists. We are here to talk about everything from what inspired scientists become scientists to what they're doing today at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory and OU Sims. We are really, really excited that you all have joined us here today. My name is Vanna Milewski. I study lightning here at the lab and I will be reading your questions today for our panelists. You have met all of our panelists in our introductory video. And we're very lucky to have them here with us today to share their stories. A uh, big thank you to Katie Wilson, who came here all the way from England and found people that she loves working with. Uh, Pat Highlands, who discovered a love of weather at a young age that grew from a fear of storms. Elizabeth Smith, who gets to drive around that really large truck she always wanted to and study the world around her. And Jacob Siegel, who moved across the country twice and experienced some unusual weather along the way that uh, developed into a personal connection with the science of meteorology. Uh, we do have some questions which were already submitted uh, through the email and we're going to start with those. But it's not too late for you to submit more questions for our panelists. You can submit questions at any point in time. Uh, if you look over at the GoToWebinar sidebar, there should be a little header that says questions. At any point in time, please write down your question and submit it there and we will collect them throughout the meeting and try to get to as many as we can. Um, you can submit those questions for everyone to address, or if you have more questions for one specific panelist, uh, you can submit them for a certain person as well. Um, hopefully we get to all your questions today, but just in case we don't you, and you want to find out more or you think of more questions after this live session, you can always send an email to nssl.outreach at noaa.gov. We are always happy to answer questions. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So our first question that was submitted was from Megan S. And she was wondering if any of you experienced a significant weather event that made you interested in pursuing a job in the weather field. And uh, Jacob, you mentioned something in your introductory video. Would you like to start us off and answer her question? Sure. Um... So yeah, as I mentioned in the video, we were, it was the first day of our trip and we had just crossed over into Ohio. So somewhere along the PA Ohio border. Um, and I just remember seeing this like massive uh, anvil cloud just in front of us. And my dad always used to joke cause he loved weather being an engineer. He knows some of the science, but he was just like, oh, this is gonna be a rough one. And then I just vividly remember we got into it and just watching this huge bolt of lightning come down and strike a tree right off the side of the road and just burst into flames. And just after that, my dad was like, okay, I think we need to, I think we need to pull over and stop going. And it was just like that whole memory uh, just really stuck to me. And then I also have this, not only the memory of driving into it, but then as we were finally getting out of the storm, turning around and looking out the back window, and just seeing the, you know, the huge storm as it was moving by. And yeah, just that, that image stuck with me throughout my life and really forced me on the path I wanted. I don't think I could have chosen anything else, even if I had wanted to. Q, 
Katie, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, so I, I mentioned in my intro video that um, I grew up in England, and so we, we didn't have the big supercell type thunderstorms that you guys have here, at least not very frequently, and we certainly don't have big tornadoes. Um, so I didn't really have a lot of those experiences, but there were a couple of nuggets from when I was younger that I was thinking about the other day. Um, and it mostly relates to, to strong winds. I remember having tiles um, fall off the house roof when I was really young and wondering what on earth caused that. Um, and, and it was a windstorm. And then another time I was younger and walking with a shopping bag and this gust of wind just caught me. And it literally wrapped me around a light pole. And um, and you know those those instances didn't scare me, but they stuck with me. And I always wondered how how does that happen? How do those forces come to be? And so th there's definitely little things along the way, um, but no big tornadoes or anything like that. Hi. Yeah, I uh, I definitely had an event that kind of catapulted me into meteorology. Um, as I mentioned in the video, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I actually had a little league baseball game, and this was in Bay Village. It was one of the uh, suburbs of Cleveland, and the, the sky started to get really dark, and it was getting really windy, and all of a sudden the sirens started to go off. And so it's like, what are we supposed to do? I was really little. I had no idea what the sirens meant. Um, so when I heard those sirens, my parents grabbed me, we got into our car and tried to drive away because of the ball field there, there was really no safe place to hide. So we got the car and tried to drive away. And as we were leaving the driveway for the ball field, there was a tree that fell and it missed hitting the back of our car by a matter of feet. And so um, I was already afraid of storms and that didn't really help out with any of that stuff. But then I was like, why? did this happen? And I started to study up on it and it just got me really interested. I turned that fear into what I do right now. So um, almost getting hit by a tree at a little league baseball game was, was the event that really did it for me. Elizabeth? Yeah, uh, I think everybody here has kind of mentioned some of the individual experiences that they had, but in my case, I mentioned in the video that I, you know, as school went forward, figured out that weather was what I was interested in. And at that point, I thought one of the only jobs a meteorologist could have was a broadcast meteorologist. So that's what I was thinking about at that point. And then in 2005, Hurricane Katrina happened, and that was a large, you know, impactful storm, and it was covered very widely in the news. And um, there was a big change in how the National Weather Service issues warnings for such storms at that time. And so that was covered in the news. And at that point, I became aware that there are these people working off camera, doing forecasting, and more importantly for me, doing research. Um, and so that really opened my eyes to the other opportunities there are in the field. Um, and then a year later, so now I'm interested in trying to figure this out, a year later in 2006, a very rare, strong supercell moved over my hometown in West Virginia and dropped inches of golf ball hail. And so we had hail fog and it was just this amazing experience that I knew that I had to know what that was. Um, and so the trajectory was kind of set then. Thanks everyone. Our next question is from Kat L. Uh, she says her city, Calgary, Alberta, um, is what she's asking about specifically. Uh, she was wondering why the Okotoks, Airdrie, and Chestermere seem to be hit more often than Calgary by tornadoes. And she was wondering if large hills can divert a storm. And Elizabeth, you study things that are near the ground like tornadoes and strong winds specifically. So do you wanna uh, address whether or not Calgary may or may not be protected by the hills? Absolutely. Um, so it's definitely true that local terrain or even cities and buildings can really change the way that winds move across the surface of the earth. So, you know, if you've ever been in a city where you have really tall buildings, you'll feel the wind being a bit stronger kind of sometimes in what we would call the city canyon between those buildings. So we know that that's definitely true. However, um, storms are usually 
quite large. And so they have other forcings that really drive them and move them. And then usually the effects of terrain can't really um, control that portion of the storm. Um, I know sometimes, if, especially if you're storm interested, it really does feel like the storms do miss you. Um, I think almost every uh, one of us on this call can complain about that. Um, but there's no reason that topography or local features like cities or rivers should really um, control where storms do or do not move. Was there anything that anyone else wants to add on to that one? Not really. Like Elizabeth said, um, you know, everybody talks about like a bubble around them, protecting them from storms, but there is no bubble. That bubble bursts every once in a while. Um, you know, severe weather can happen in lots of different places and, you know, up there in Calgary and other parts of Canada, they can get severe weather in like the late summer months. So um, it's always best to, well, I always tell people, you know, don't be scared, be prepared. As long as you've got everything in place and you're paying attention to what's going on and what the weather forecasts are, then um, you've got nothing to worry about. Um, and don't rely on rivers or hills or anything like that to um, protect you from those because um, as, Liz as Elizabeth talked about, you know, they can happen even with those terrain effects. Thanks guys. Our, our next question is from Jacob K. And he's wondering if there is a place uh, for social science research within the National Weather Service. And if so, what does that research look like? So Katie, you get to work a lot with uh, forecasters and on the social side of things. Would you like to answer the question about social, social science research in the National Weather Service? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, when you think of meteorologists and the National Weather Centre, um, you might think of it as being a very physical science um, based job. And there's a lot of physical science, a lot of meteorology um, that weather forecasters have to understand and think about. But there is a component of social science and it's growing um, within the weather service and within the research community also. And so you may have noticed with, with the advent of social media and, and things like that, the National Weather Service are um, able to communicate with you, the public, a lot more easily than they've been able to in the past. And there's a shift in the weather service happening where they're not just providing forecasts, but they're providing decision support services. And so that means telling you not just what the forecast is, but what the impacts might be and how you can maybe prepare. And so there's this communication aspect. Um, and that's where the social sciences come into play. So how do we communicate effectively um, so that you can understand the forecast and make your preparations? And so that might even be things like thinking about, do we use words or numbers or um, different visualizations to communicate uncertainty, you know, especially if a forecast is changing over time, um, like we've just seen with, with the ice storm here in Norman, Oklahoma um, this past week. And so social science is, is growing and um, a lot of forecasters now see their responsibilities as not just meteorologists, but communicators too. And we did have a follow-up question from Jacob as well. Uh, as a social scientist investigating the impact of severe weather, uh, such as traumatic events on mental health, Jacob is wondering if there is any work similar to that going on at the National Weather Service. Are you aware of anything looking at the impacts on mental health? Yeah, I, I think um, kind of globally that the topic of mental health is becoming something that we're thinking about and talking about a lot in, in all kinds of facets of life. And we're seeing it within the weather service as well. So um, within the weather service, there's lots of um, resources becoming available to forecasters just thinking about mental health being a forecaster uh, because things like um, shift work and um, you know, staffing and fatigue and those kind of things can play into mental health. But sometimes is issuing warnings and, and working events that um, are, end up being disasters can be very difficult on mental health. And the National Weather Association has a conference each year. And this past year, they had a whole session dedicated to health and well-being. And they talked about the stress factors associated with working these events. Um, not just working them as they're happening, but going out and doing survey responses that can be very traumatic, um, interacting with the community, 
also thinking about how do weather service forecasters help their communities with mental health. I know that some offices are providing um, mental health resources for dealing with storm anxiety. And so there's a lot of activity happening around mental health and there are some researchers that are dedicating time to studying mental health within the weather service also. So it's a big topic and a really important one too. Thank you, Katie. I do want to remind all of our attendees that you can still continue submitting questions on the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel and in writing at any point in time. So do feel free to just keep those questions flowing in and we will be continuing to answer them for as long as we're here. Um, one of the first questions that we received over there was to all of our panelists asking, what is your favorite cloud? That is from Becca H. So Pat, let's go ahead and start with you. Favorite cloud? Yeah, what's your favorite cloud? Uh, I, I love this question. So um, one of my favorite cloud is actually the newest cloud that was added to the classification system. Um, and it was actually because there is a person that is in charge of the Cloud Appreciation Society. And they had seen this cloud in other places and other people had taken pictures of it and they were pleading with, to the World Meteorological Organization to add it as a new cloud type because they were noticing it in a lot of different places. Uh, and they finally got it. Uh, that cloud type is called undulatus asperatus. So it's these really cool wavy clouds that you get uh, when there's um, passages of cold fronts, things like that. Um, so I think those are awesome. I love like capturing time lapses of those clouds because you can see all the different wave features. So um, you, you might have thought that I like cumulonimbus because I like storms, but it's actually, I love undulatus asperatus clouds. Those are my favorite. So I love all clouds, want to get that out there first, uh, but when I have to choose, I usually um, tell people that my favorite cloud is the Arcus cloud, which is a little bit unfair because that's a category of clouds, but an Arcus cloud might be a shelf cloud, which you actually saw in the video, the picture of um, myself on the back of the pickup truck, there was a shelf cloud coming toward us out of a storm. But Arcus clouds can also form in different scenarios, like just in the clear boundary layer, you can have these really beautiful cylindrical white clouds that kind of roll along with the flow. Um, they're very, very interesting. So if I have to pick, that's my favorite. Jacob? Uh, well, Pat took the undulatus, so I'm gonna have to find a new one. But um, having lived out in Washington for a couple of years, I grew really, I fell in love with the uh, lenticular clouds that would form above the volcanoes out there and just the cascades in general. Um, so it's actually been several years since I've seen a good lenticular cloud, but I think those are my favorite because just the, the smoothness and the way they look like a UFO always fascinated me as a kid. Katie? Yeah, my favorite cloud has to be Mamatis. And so those are the ones when you look up to the sky and it, it looks like all these little pockets of air hanging down from the sky. I think they look really cool, especially at sunset when you get all the pinks and reds. Um, that's definitely my favorite. Thank you, Becca H. I think we all enjoy talking about our favorite clouds. Uh, we did have a question specifically for Katie and Elizabeth. Um, did you encounter any challenges studying math and science as a female from Mommy H? So, uh, Elizabeth, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so, that's a really important question, Molly. So, thank you for asking it. Uh, historically, there haven't been very many women in a lot of sciences, including meteorology, um, that is changing. So, when I was an undergraduate, um, I was the only girl in my graduating class. And that was sometimes hard. Um, there are some benefits to it. When you travel, you get to be the only one. Um, so you usually get a private room, so that's nice. Um, but there are definitely some challenges uh, in those classes specifically. So when you're in those sometimes upper level math courses, they start to become very male dominated. I would say that in the modern era, that's changing and a lot of the males in those classes are a bit more aware than they used to be, so that's better. And usually you find in those upper level courses, um, a few other women or girls that are interested too, and you can 
make these really strong connections and relationships with those people. And that's what gets you through some of the hard days. Yeah, I think that's a great question too, Molly. Um, you know, when I was, so I grew up in England, went and did my, all my qualifications there until I was 18, but at the age of 16, I had to choose what I wanted to specialize in. And it didn't actually even occur to me to specialize in mathematics and physics. Like it didn't even cross my mind until my teachers approached me. I didn't even think I was capable and they thought I was. Um, and so for me, it was a lot more about confidence and, and a perception you don't see, or I didn't see a lot of females taking maths and physics at that age. Um, my classes at that age were very male dominated and it, it just didn't, it just didn't occur to me. And then I ended up taking those classes and loving them. And when I went off to university, I had a different experience to Elizabeth. I was actually shocked because my class was pretty much 50-50 female and male. And so um, it, it felt a lot more balanced. And like Elizabeth said, I think with time and just the time that we've gone through um, our university programs, it has changed. I think there's a lot more effort to um, encourage females to pursue science and that's paying off. And so um, the times are changing, but definitely in terms of capability, there was no difference based on gender. It was a lot more about confidence and, and believing that this is something that you know suits you and that you're able to do. So if you're interested in it, I say go for it. Thanks guys. And thanks Molly for submitting that question. Um, question for all of our panelists. Uh, what was your favorite class or the class that impacted you the, impacted you the most in either undergraduate or graduate school from Cheryl L? Uh, Jacob, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so actually funny, um, there's two different classes for each of those. So my favorite class was the radar meteorology class that I took just because it was the topic that I had fallen in love with at the time and was really passionate about. But um, I think the class that impacted me the most was actually an atmospheric radiation course. And that was just because the professor that I had in that course was so laid back and easygoing and ridiculously smart. And he kind of broke that shell that you have to be this like very rigid person to be very intelligent. I mean, the guy was just fun. He, you could have a beer with him and laugh and all that, but then he would just go on and tell you the workings of the world and you'd explain them like you'd never understood them before. Um, so I think it was that class that impacted me the most and kind of led me, made me realize that research might actually be a field that I wanted to go into and not just, you know, studying weather for fun or going into broadcast meteorology or something like that. Thank you. Katie? This is a really hard question because all of the classes are so different and they offer something different, but it wasn't necessarily um, the, the content of the class, but I remember taking an oceanography class when I was in my final year of my undergraduate degree. And for me, during that class, things started to click. I started gaining a lot of confidence, you know, believing, oh gosh, I actually understand material and can do well, but also I had a research component to that class. And, um, and I started learning how to do computer programming and just kind of gaining traction with doing research and figuring out what their research process involves. And, um, and that really opened my eyes up to what it might mean to be a researcher. And so um, it, it was more about, um, I think it kind of helped me learn a little bit more about myself and my capabilities. Um, so it's really hard to pick. They're all so different, but that one stands out for those reasons. Um, I think my favorite class uh, had to have been, I, I took a radar class with uh, Dr. Vigerstaff at OU. Um, I really liked the class um, because it had a mixture of lecture material and lab material. Um, so it was really nice to like learn about stuff during lecture, but then actually go into the lab portion and work through that stuff. So it was, you know, coding up various things to bring up different things with the radar data that we were looking at. Uh, the other cool part about that class is he took us to Lloyd Noble Center to play with one of the smart radars, and that's the Shared Mobile Atmospheric Research and Teaching Radar. Uh, the School of Meteorology, in partnership with the National Severe Storm Lab, actually has two of those, 
And so we got to take that to Lloyd Noble and play around with it. And that was my first time actually operating uh, one of the smart radars. And after that, um, in my graduate studies, I actually got to you know, take the smart radars out to Florida and New Mexico, and I got to operate other radar platforms. So um, having that initial experience in that class and that mixture, and uh, uh, Dr. Biggerstaff is such a great professor too. He made everything uh, easy to understand, very personable. Um, so that was probably my most favorite class that I took uh, throughout all of my meteorology career. So my favorite class, um, or actually, I guess I should say the class that impacted me the most in undergraduate was actually the last class I took, which was an advanced synoptic course, which synoptic meteorology is what most people think of when they think about meteorology. This is large maps and fronts and things like this. Um, and that made it very clear to me that I did not enjoy forecasting. And so that was not a career choice for me. Um, and so while the class was okay, I knew that this was just not something I could do for the rest of my life. So that was very impactful because it solidified my choice of a career. Once I moved on to graduate school, I took um, an advanced dynamics course, which is you know, the study of basically the atmosphere as a fluid and how the atmosphere moves like a fluid. And this class was just incredible um, and it was so much fun every day to just think about these really complex mechanisms that, that really just come down to the atmosphere is a fluid that's so pretty cool thanks everyone i like the variety in everyone's favorite classes um, we have a question from chelsea g uh, do you know why minnesota has had more tornadoes this year than last year and why more in upper Minnesota than the lower part of Minnesota? Has anyone looked at Minnesota tornadoes recently? And I'm going to put this out there as an open open question to the panel. I was actually in, in Minnesota a couple months ago um, visiting a couple of friends, and we were actually in a tornado warning uh, at one point during uh, that visit. and. Um, you know, it was kind of weird, you know, thinking that, you know, our severe weather season here in Oklahoma um, wasn't really what we normally experience uh, in Oklahoma in terms of tornadoes, you know, the 60 or so that we see a year. Um, but uh, up there, we saw one in Minnesota and it was just, it was interesting, but that time of year, you know, June, July, August timeframe is typically when you see severe weather up in the Northern Plains. Um, it all has to do with how the jet stream sets up. Um, and so that time of year, it's you know pushed a little bit upward into that area, so you can't get severe weather. And that goes back to the question that we had uh, from the uh, guest talking about Calgary. Also, that's typically when they have severe weather up there. Um, and it's it's really hard to tell, like from one season to another, if you're going to have more or less severe weather. You know, there are certain ingredients that we look for in the atmosphere in order to get severe weather. Um, and those ingredients have to come together just right. And sometimes they come together a lot, other times they don't. Um, so that's one of the interesting things about being a meteorologist is you're kind of that detective and putting all that information together and looking at those ingredients to figure out where uh, severe weather can occur. And sometimes it happens in places where uh, it's not as anticipated as much as others. Um, but uh, you can have severe weather up there in Minnesota during certain times of the year. There is a climatology uh, throughout the U.S. when you can get severe weather. Thank you, Pat. Did anyone have anything else they wanted to add on to that? All right. So our next question is from McKenzie R. And we'll start with you, Elizabeth, on this one. Uh, do you just go out to predict storms or have you ever been in a storm to see what it was like? Great question. Uh, a lot of what we do as researchers is try to understand why certain aspects of weather or storms might be harder to predict or harder to understand. So a big part of my job is to take various instruments out into the field and try to take measurements near storms. So I'm saying near storms, not in storms. It's an important difference. Um, but we do get quite close to collect important measurements so that we can learn more about how these storms behave, how they change, maybe why some might produce tornadoes and others won't, which ones produce hails, which ones don't. Um, so that's really important to the type of science that we do. 
I do want to note, though, that the type of science that we do is dependent on excellent prediction. Um, it might look easy if you, you know, look on YouTube or whatever, um, but it's actually pretty hard to track down one of these storms and get in position to measure what you want to measure. And um, so we do need, you know, the best of the best to help us out with those predictions. Um, and we do get that assistance. So that's one of the great parts about being part of the community at the National Weather Center. Did anyone have anything they want to add on to you? I think Elizabeth pretty much covered that one. All right, our next question is from Becca H. And it's, do you need an undergrad, an undergraduate degree in atmospheric science and or meteorology to go to graduate school for it? Her university does not offer a major in either. Uh, Jacob, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so from my experience, I did get a degree in meteorology, but I know when I was in grad school, I actually had several colleagues that um, one was a chemistry major who then went to grad school for mechanical engineering and then got a master's in that. And then I was working on a PhD in atmospheric science. I know a couple other people who took the engineering route or mathematics route and then came into atmospheric science. So um, I think as long as you're in some sort of science related field, that's definitely going to set you up uh, best to go into the field, but I'm not necessarily sure if even that would be a requirement. Um, from my experience, it seems like diversity is the best way to go to. Um, does anyone else have any other examples of other undergraduate degrees that they're aware of that people have joined us in meteorology with afterwards? I would just like to quickly add, um, at my first year here at the University of Oklahoma as a graduate student, we take a class that's called Fundamentals of Atmospheric Science. And um, they're all of the first year students are in that class together. And so we um, are sitting next to people that have meteorology or atmospheric science degrees or physics degrees or chemistry degrees. And we're all going through that course together. Um, and previous degree is not a predictor of success in that course. Um, as long as you have that solid science and mathematics background, um, the rest you can learn. Actually, I have a personal story on that. Uh, my wife actually got a undergraduate degree in geology from the University of Southern California. And uh, she, was, she got to be a Hollings scholar. Um, so she was really interested in meteorology and got to come to the Weather Center and do a research project with the National Severe Storms Lab and loved it so much that she ended up coming to graduate school at the University of Oklahoma um, to study meteorology. And she was often doing better in the graduate courses than the uh, majors that came in with meteorology degrees. And so um, we have lots of examples of people coming in to the program uh, with degrees that aren't in meteorology. I have a number of friends that, you know, got physics degrees and uh, they are, got PhDs in meteorology and are working in various sectors now too. So um, as Jacob mentioned, having that good math and science background in whatever field it is, um, you can apply that to meteorology. Um, I do want to let everyone know we are going to be running low on time, so I'm going to try to hit as many questions as we can from this. If we do not get to your question, uh, do please feel free to email nssl.outreach at noaa.gov. And the, our outreach team, they're amazing people. We're very grateful to have them here with us, helping us make this panel happen to you today. They will direct the questions to the right people, and we can respond to you via email if we don't make it on the video today. Uh, our next question that we did have submitted today from Ferris and Landon is what kind of programming would be useful to know when working in the field at NOAA? Um, Jacob, you did uh, mentioned working behind a computer in your intro video. So would you like to talk a little bit about the programming too? Sure. Um, so I'm actually now currently learning C++. Um, I learned it in college a little bit, but then I kind of put it on the back burner because Python um, kind of took over and, and MATLAB a little bit. Um, but then when I got to NSSL, I realized the C++ was definitely the way to go. So I've been just kind of rehashing over old lessons and making sure I, I know what I'm talking about. Um, but the, the two big ones that I was always told were C++ and Python. 
Um, and I learned uh, essentially from my, I want to say freshman year in college, they started introducing Python concepts and then getting you to work with object oriented based programming and things like that. So um, I, I think the nice thing about a lot of cute computer languages is that they are kind of interchangeable in some ways. So if you know one, it's a little bit easier to learn the other. Um, but if I had any recommendations, Python and C++ are definitely the big ones. Anyone else have any other languages they want to add on to that as useful ones to know? Um, I'll add that, you know, there's there are lots of different languages, but there's actually something called software carpentry, which is where you basically learn just the aspects of how programming works. So you learn, you get this foundation, how everything works, and then you can apply it to different programming languages. So you're not necessarily learning one programming language and either getting really good at it or kind of good at it. You're learning just the way that programs are built and how things work, and then you can apply it to lots of different programming languages. So software, I uh, advise you to look into software carpentry, and there are ways to get those brain cells connected to do all the other programming stuff, and then you can hop from different programming languages with a lot of success. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Adam W. And it is, what is one piece of advice each of you could provide to a current graduate student currently involved in severe weather and tornado research who is interested in working at NSSL after grad school? Uh, Katie, would you like to start us off on that one? That's a great question. Um, well, if I if I was in your shoes, um, one thing is I would um, try to learn as much as I can about the kind of research that's happening um, at NSSL. There's a great web page and you can learn about all kinds of projects going on and who the researchers are um, and try to think about what interests you about those projects. And I really think that networking, reaching out, um, sharing the kind of work that you're doing with people who are working in the field is a, is a great way to get connected um, and then there's always lots of job advertisements that that go online so looking at those and looking at the kind of requirements that are listed and um, what kind of skills are, are nssl and sam's looking for um, and seeing you know do you have those skills do you need to develop those skills to be a good candidate that would be a great way to prepare Pat, what one piece of advice would you share? Um, so I actually did not come to Sims and NSSL with a uh, with a job in meteorology ahead of that. Uh, so I actually the first job that I had out of my degrees in meteorology was a marketing and PR specialist position, um, and I spent about five years doing that. So my piece of advice would be to diversify your skill set. So don't just segment yourself into one particular, you know, field or study, or uh, just make sure that you can diversify as much of yourself as you can. So if that means building programming, if that means uh, taking, you know, communication courses and things like that to make you a better science communicator. Um, and it could be some of those, you know, uh, it could be some of those marketing things too, because you gotta be able to market yourself as a scientist and make what you're putting together interesting so that other people are going to be interested about it too. So I'd say don't pigeonhole yourself into one particular thing, but diversify as much as you can to make yourself a lot more marketable. Elizabeth, how about your one piece? So um, Katie and Pat have already given some pretty good advice. So I think what I would add to that is um, a skill that is often overlooked by students uh, is their writing and their ability to communicate. Um, writing and communication is a lot of how science ends up really getting done. So be sure not to skimp on that. Um, become the best scientific writer that you can. Um, most universities have a writing center that can help you with some fundamentals, but sometimes uh, those professionals aren't as well versed in the type of scientific writing that we do. Um, so I strongly encourage you to you know, stay up to date with the literature and read a lot so that um, you can learn more about how scientific writing should be done. Jacob? 
Um, yeah, so this is kind of stemming off of what Elizabeth said about communication, but um, my piece of advice would be to network. I mean, do not be afraid if you read a paper that someone wrote it on a topic that you're really interested in. Most scientists are very excited to talk about their work. So if you send them a message, and as long as you're good at communicating what you're interested in and talking about, most people will respond and be glad to set up some sort of meeting to talk. Um, and, and the value of networking really can't be understated. Um, I mean, I think most of us can probably attribute a lot of our positions in life to the connections we made with people along our path. So um, yeah, definitely work on networking. All right, and we have, we have lots more questions, but we are very quickly running out of time. Uh, so these will be our last couple of questions. Um, so I'm trying to find ones that are quick to answer. If we don't hit your question and you still want to learn more, please do reach out to the nssl.outreach at noaa.gov email address, and we will address it via email afterwards. Um, one of the questions uh, that I think is kind of interesting uh, from Rachel N that we can address pretty quickly. Did any of you land your positions with less than stellar undergraduate performance? So did you struggle in undergraduate school but still end up here at NSSL? Yeah, I can feel that one first. Um, <laughs> I notoriously goofed off in high school and in uh, the first couple years of college. And I think one of the reasons that atmospheric radiation course was so impactful on me was that that was the teacher that kind of put me on the right path and, and got me to focus on the subject that I, I, mean, I had always willy nilly said I loved meteorology and I was in meteorology classes, but I still didn't take it as seriously as I needed to. Um, and so for the first two years, yeah, my grades were less than stellar. And I actually applied to several grad schools where my response was everything else looks good on your resume except for your grades. Sorry, look elsewhere. Um, so it was a struggle, but it definitely, I think, made me uh, more resilient and definitely more determined to, one, prove to people that, you know, I was worthy of this, but then also, too, to just prove to myself that, you know, that was just truly me goofing off and this is me serious now. So, um, yeah, you can make it. You just got to, you just got to try hard. Jacob, you want to have anything else they wanted to add to that? I'd add that I I didn't get straight A's throughout school. Um, you know, there were some classes that I excelled at and others I struggled with. And there was one class in particular when I was on my exchange year. Um, it's it's a core meteorology class that they look to see how you do when you apply for graduate school. And I hadn't done very well. And it, it did impact nearly my ability to come. But thankfully, the person who hired me as her assistant, uh, she, she went to bat for me. So I was able to come. And one thing I'll say is if you have classes that you struggle in, I, I don't think that that um, determines how good a researcher you are. There are lots of skills that you need to be a good researcher that aren't included in your classes like creativity and being able to collaborate and communication um, written and written communication and being able to present your work to to the world um, so you know just keep trying your best but don't think that research isn't an option thanks guys um, and i think this will probably have to be our last question uh, this is from michael k I want to work in extreme weather research and simulations with my physics and computer science experience. What opportunities would you recommend outside of academia? So I can hop in here. Uh, there are lots of opportunities in the private sector to apply these sorts of skills. Uh, so, you know, insurance companies care about extreme weather. Uh, that's, you know, the forensic meteorology. It's a field. It sounds kind of funny, but it's a field. And um, there are lots of private companies now getting into cloud computing and prediction. Uh, so there is a lot going on in the private sector. Uh, one good way to kind of get in touch with that is to look at some of our national conferences like the AMS and NWA, look at those abstracts um, and see what the affiliations of different people are. And you'll see which companies are kind of in the game, so to speak. I think that's great advice. Did anyone have any other thoughts on that?
All right, well, we've, we've reached the end of our official panel discussion. Uh, thank you all for attending uh, Get to Know Scientists here at NSSL. We really appreciate it. We're glad you joined us. Uh, this panel was recorded and will be available later. Uh, and also, if we did not reach your question, I am so sorry. Uh, there's only so much time, but do please email us at nssl.outreach at noaanoa.gov, and we will answer your questions through email there. Uh, much thanks to all of our panelists for answering your questions. Uh, did a great job. And also to our media team, Kelly and Emily and James, for helping make all of this happen. And I hope everyone who attended uh, enjoys the rest of the virtual National Weather Festival and stay safe.